Okay, so if I were doing these problems, I'd be looking for something that I can handle. And for me looking over it, I'm going to say number five looks like the easiest one for me to comprehend. So it says a nickel is placed on a flat table. Again, I'm not, drawing, I'm not good at drawing pictures, but I'll, I'll try to visualize number five. And I would put a nickel down. And then what I would do is I'd place a nickel right next to it that's tangent to it. And nickel would look something like this over here. And certainly, I, I, don't know the, I don't know the diameter of a nickel, but I do know something about this over here. There'd be another nickel right next to it, and it would form an equilateral triangle at this point. All right, what does that mean? It means the angle over here would be 60 degrees. So I'm gonna say this is my reference nickel. The next one would go down at 60 degrees. The next nickel would go down at 120 degrees. I'm not gonna to continue to draw these over here. The next one would go down to 180 degrees. I'm just rotating around. Then 240 degrees. And then 300 degrees. And then I'm back to the beginning. So how many nickels would I get? Well, I got this reference guy. The first one's here. And you're going with triangles. That's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six nickels. All right. Let's look at the K. And I'm going to get a number five. That was the lowest problem that I could comprehend there very quickly, too. Whoops. That's not what I'm doing. So let's say a nickel is placed on a flat table. Yeah, I just read that. Connect the midpoints given nickels and two other nickels placed around it in three touch. Forms an equal triangle of 60 degrees. Yeah, writing it up. Six nickels. Yeah, we got it. All right. Six nickels can be placed next to that one nickel on the table. All right. So what I want to do is I want to. Um, I want to look back over the problems, but I am going to be looking at the blue area. But one thing I want to encourage is that, you know, people can differ in what they believe is easy and what's difficult. So when I'm looking at these problems over here, you know, some of the things I, I think might be easy to do, which may not be easy to do, let me get this all erased up here. And I, again, I'm looking for, let's take a look. I'm going to say one looks like the toughest. Two looks like it might have something to do with a sum formula, maybe a sum to product of formula. Let me put this down. So what do I know for number two? I'm looking at number two now. So in number two, they know it's a, I know it's a triangle, so I know that A plus B plus C is 180 degrees, all right? Now they give me things, they tell me the sine of A. Well, I gotta write this down now, don't I? It seems like they're using some kind of sum formula here and they got sine, sine, cosine, cosine. Let me put on what I mean by that. I'm looking at this over here and I'm looking at this over here and I'm thinking this has something to do with a sum formula. So I'm going to write this over here for you. So I'm going to write down the sine B plus C is going to be equal to the, no, I don't want to do sine B plus B. I want to do cosine, right? Put that down. Cosine of B plus C. is going to be equal to cosine B, cosine C, minus sine B, sine C. All right, let's see if I can, if I can understand that over here. Do I know cosine B, cosine C? It's right there. What is it going to be? It's cosine A over 2017 minus, well, do I know the sine of B sine C? I do, it's sine of A over 2017, all right? Now, here's my problem over here. I got this cosine B plus C, and I have to think about that now. And what I'm gonna do over here is say that I gotta be careful now, right? So I, I gotta write down, you know, B plus C, because I wanna get an A out of this thing over here. 
So let's see, B plus C is the same thing as what? 180 degrees minus, I'm sorry, not minus C, that's crazy. Let me get my eraser out. I'm gonna put down A over here. By the way, this could be a dead end, right? But let me write this over here. So the cosine of B plus C is really the same thing as the cosine of 180 degrees minus A. Right, get everything in terms of A at this point, which is probably good. And I'll tell you why, they, they wanna get the tangent, but I'm not even close to that yet. So I'm gonna see if I can come up with this. And this, this left side is really cosine 180 degrees times a cosine of A plus the sine of 180 degrees times the sine of A. And that equals the cosine of A over 2017 minus the sine of A over 2017. Well, at least everything's in terms of A now. I'm looking at this over here, and I, I noticed something nice about it. I want to tell you what I noticed nice about it, that this thing is just zero. And what's this guy over here? Well, the cosine of, of um, 180 degrees is just simply minus 1, right? So let me write this over. So this is going to be minus cosine A is equal to cosine of A, 2017, minus the sine of A, over 2017. I'm going to get rid of the, two, the, the fraction by multiplying both sides by 2017. So you get minus 2017 cosine of A equals cosine of A minus sine of A. Well, let's see what you get. I'm going to subtract cosine of A. That's minus 2018, right? Cosine of A equals minus sine of A. And what was the question? They want to know what the tangent was, right? So I got to divide both sides by the cosine of A. And by minus 1, right? So what do you get? 2, 0, 1, 8 equals the tangent of A. Let's see if I made a mistake somewhere. I seem like an outrageous number, doesn't it? So let's see. Did I write down what they said? They said sine of A was uh, 2017 sine B sine C. And I wrote that over here. And then I got the cosine of A um, over 2017 was cosine B cosine C. I did that. Next thing I, I did was that was the cosine of B plus C. Did I do that right? Yeah, I did okay. And then B plus C is the same thing as 180 minus A. I wrote that down. And I got cosine 180 cosine A sine 180 sine A, that's a plus sign, right? So let's make sure I did that right. Yeah, minus cosine A, cosine of 180, one, well, minus one. Multiply both sides by 2017. I get minus 2017 cosine A equals cosine A minus sine A, minus 218. Divide both sides by minus one and cosine A. Yeah, I'm pretty good, I'm done. All right, so let's take a look. And let's look at the key. And that key, I think I did, what problems have we done so far? I did five, and now I, I just, I think I did number two, right? Let's look at number two, see how we did. Oh yeah, right here, we got it, 2018. Not bad, we did all right, all right? So I'm gonna get my eraser out again. You know what, maybe I don't wanna erase it. Maybe I wanna, I wanna start looking at the key. Right, one scaring me though. I'm gonna to go to number three though. And I wanna point out, as I go to number three, I am gonna do the blue area. You know, I always, I, I neatly tight things up. I realize that you're probably looking at my chicken scratch and wondering how I eventually get to that typed up work. I gotta put the chicken scratch down first and then I type it up. And then of course, sometimes I read it, sometimes I don't read it. It is a problem, by the way. They always say the average number of readers of a mathematics article is less than one which means the guy writing it doesn't even read it. A lot of things get published, by the way, where people are not reading the material. So 
let's take a look. I'm going to do that Alice and uh, Bill walking around. Right, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go through it, but I, I am going to flip the page for you. So it says Alice and Bill are walking in opposite directions along the same route between A and B. So I'm going to put A here, and I'm going to put B over here, and I'm going to say there's some road between the two, all right? So the same route between them. I, someone says, why put a straight line down? It's easy for me to just draw that picture. could be something entirely different, by the way. It says A and B, okay? Alice is going from A to B. So Alice is going in this direction, all right? And then we'll say, um, you know, Alice going from A to B, but Bill is going from B to A, okay? If they start at the same time, right? They start at the same time. They pass each other three hours later. Right, so I, I gotta, I gotta start thinking about what's happening here. That Bill's walk, walking through Alice, Alice walked on Bill, and they meet in three hours. They meet somewhere. I don't, I'm not sure where they meet, but they meet somewhere. All right, they pass each. That means I met. Then it goes on to say Alice arrives at B two and a half hours before Bill arrives at A. So now I'm gonna say this is some information. I'm just gonna say T. We'll flip the page a little bit in a, in a bit moment. T equals Bill's total time to travel from A to B. So Bill's time to get from A to B. Um, he's going from B to A. Sorry about that. And then Alice... Right, what Alice does, right? Let's take a look. Alice arrives at B, right, two and a half hours before. So what does that mean? It's T minus 2.5, which is Alice's time. To get from A to B. I hope you can agree, although I don't know the difference between A and B, that they're really the same distance from A to B or B to A. So this distance over here is, I'm just going to call it D. And I'm starting to think to myself, as I probably could write down Alice's rate now and Bill's rate. And the reason for that is, if it's a uniform motion problem, I'm assuming they're forming uniformly, that distance is equal to rate times time. All right, so thinking about it, let's write this down. So I'm gonna write down the distance for both of them is the same. Hope you can greet that. Let's write down Bill's equation now. It's gonna be D equals Bill's rate. I'm gonna say R B for Bill's rate times the time. All right, and Alice's rate, she does the same distance, is gonna be the rate at Alice, but she is doing what? T minus 2.5, right? So I'm gonna write this down for you. I'm gonna write down D over R, no, nope, I'm going to do it over T would equal the rate of Bill. And D over T minus 2.5 is going to be Alice's rate. Again, there's other relationships to write down, but it looks like a pretty simple relationship. And now the question is, what are you going to do with all that information? Well... I'm gonna do something else with it, and I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I know they met, and I said they met in three hours. So I'm gonna say they met over here somewhere, but they met in three hours. So what does that mean? Well, that means that 
three times Alice's rate. I'm still doing the same formula. Three times Alice's rate, which is D over T minus 2.5 plus, well, I got to do uh, Bill too, right? And what's Bill going to be? Three times D over T. And again, I want to point out what's happening over here. I hope you realize that, you know, Alice is going that distance. Bill's going to just, I'm adding their distance together. And what would it equal? It would actually equal the entire distance D, which I don't know what it is, by the way. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to simplify the equation. And to do that, I would probably divide both sides by D. It's a non-zero number, so I can do that. And let me write this down. I'm going to go to the next page. By the way, notice in my next page I made an error. I'll have to correct this. This is actually Alice's rate. Now, I just want to go back over here and point out I should have this equation written down over here. And let's see if I do. I see it right here. All right, let's talk about it one step at a time. I said I would divide through by D. And if you do that, you would get 3 over T. That's the first term. Then you get 3 over T minus 2.5. And then I get 1 over here. The next thing I would do is I'd multiply both sides by the LCD. And the LCD is going to be equal to T times T minus 2.5. Let's do that. What do you get? You would get 3 times t minus 2.5 plus 3t is equal to t times t minus 2.5. Let me do the arithmetic. You would get 3t, or the algebra, some people say, t, and minus... Well, that would be, uh, let's see, 6 and 1.5, 7.5, plus 3t. On the right-hand side, you get t squared minus 2.5t. I want to keep moving forward on this, right? And what do you get over there? 6t minus 7.5. equals t squared minus 2.5t. And I also get a quadratic, right? So what do we get over here? I get 0. I'm using the zero product rule. is equal to t squared. I would subtract 6 from both sides. That's minus 8.5t. And then it add 7.5 to both sides. You get 7.5 you know what, I realize decimals are problematic, but I think this factorization looks pretty easy now. You're going to get t minus 1, t minus 7.5. Again, if you multiply it, you get t squared minus 7.5, minus 1 is minus 8.5. That works out pretty nicely. What are the answers over here? t equals 1 or t equals 7.5. Now, I realize it's often confusing to get two answers to a question because you're wondering, could there be two possibilities? But I want to point out, it, t can't be 1. And why is that? Alice's time would be negative. That can't happen, all right? So I'm going to say that t has to be 7.5. Now, let's go back and see what the question was. Right? I don't know what the question was. I can't remember. It says, how many hours does it take Bill to go from B to A, 7.5 hours now. I know what T is, and that's Bill's time. 7.5 hours. All right, let's see if we did that. And do they write that down? Oh, T could only be seven and, a half and one half hours. They do write that over there. All right, so I, I, again, I want to just, you know, briefly go through, you know, some of the stuff that we've talked about so far. I'm going to go back to the original problem set. And we'll talk about what we didn't do. Um, I felt five was probably the easiest one to do. And this is an opinion. Um, I Two wasn't bad. And we got through that. Three wasn't bad. 
I'm going to go number four now. I'm voting number one for a reason, but it looks really tough to me. So I'm going to go number four. And I'm going to talk through it. I'm going to erase my uh, chicken scratch from the prior problem. And I'm going to talk through it. And i got to be honest with you. What a lot of students would do over here, which I wouldn't say is a bad idea, but to me it looks like a bad idea, they would try to plug the number in. Now, if this were like f of 1, I would do that. I would just plug it in. I wouldn't do anything behind to plug it in. If it were 2, I'd probably still plug it in. But this number, would be, I, I don't think it would be a good idea. For example, this would be tough to compute. This would be tough to compute. This would be tough to compute. That would all be tough to compute, in my opinion. And I don't think that would be productive. So what I want to do is I want to use a, a theorem that you've seen before. All right? So what I'm going to claim over here is you've certainly known about dividing polynomials before. And if I divide the polynomial by something, I certainly get a remainder to it, right? So let me write this over here. If I have some polynomial p of x, and I divide it by, you know, like x minus a, I would get a quotient plus a remainder that I did not finish dividing by. And then what we normally do is just simply multiply both sides by x minus a. And you get x minus a times q of x plus r of x. Well, what's nice about this is, you know, you could evaluate p at a now. And what do you get over there? Well, you would get the first term would disappear because a minus a is 0, and you would just get the remainder. That's all you'd get, evaluated a, by the way. So I'm using that, and, but I got a problem over here. It's not x minus a. This is a, a, like a, a problem that I'm starting to look at. Is It's got an irrational number in it. So what I'm going to do is not divide by x minus that number. What I'm going to do is simply say, well, that I would say that, you know, if you look at this over here, you know, x plus 1 minus root 2. And I don't want to divide by that. I'm going to divide by this. And I could write that down, right? So x, let's see, I got to do the conjugate of that, right? Make it easy to multiply it out. And that's going to be plus 1. Let's see, the conjugate of minus 1 plus root 2. Its conjugate would be minus 1 minus root 2, right? So it's going to be plus 1 plus root 2. Right, that's what we're going to divide by. And then we're going to multiply both sides by it. So we're going to take this polynomial. And we're going to divide it by that. But you know what? I don't want to do it like this is just too crazy looking. So I want to multiply that out. I'm going to cut, cut to the chase because I'm really saying that you can do that too. I say if you multiply this out, you would get x squared plus 2x minus 1. And I think that's pretty easy to multiply it out. But what I want to do is I want to write this down. So it's going to be f of x divided by that thing. And then what do you get over there? Well, what would you get? You would get x squared plus 2x minus 1 equals some quotient, if I did the division, right? Plus some remainder divided by that thing over there. And again, I'm going to cut to the chase. I realize we've been doing this for some time now. I'm going to say the division's really not that bad. All right, now you may not like division, but I'll be honest, it's a lot easier than doing this arithmetic. If you divide this into this, my claim is you're going to get this. 
Oops, sorry about that. My claim is you're going to get this over here. That's my claim. Right, if you do the division, you're going to get that. And when the dust settles, you get x8 minus x6 plus 3 plus the remainder of 4 divided by this over here. Then what I do is I simply just divide, I'm sorry, multiply both sides by x squared plus 2x minus 1. And what would I get? I would get this line over here. Then I want to evaluate this. And what do I know about this? I know something about it. And what do I know about it? I know it's a root of this factor here. What does it mean? If I plug that in, we know it's a root. It's right over here. So this would prove to be 0. So what do you get in the end? You just get 4. All right? So I'm going to say, what do we use over there? The remainder theorem. And hopefully you know about the remainder theorem. All right? Something you taught in pre-calculus. All right? So I did, it wasn't really that bad, but I'll be honest with you, if you didn't know about the conjugate and you didn't know about the division or the remainder theorem, it would have been awful if you did the evaluation, by the way. All right? So let's keep going. And what I want to do is talk about a problem and this problem over here. I believe it's a difficult problem. And what do they want to do? They want you to find a sum of all integers that satisfy this inequality. And I got to be honest with you, I hope you realize that n cannot be 0. So the first set of numbers I'm going to consider is the positives, which would be 1, 2, 3, 4, yada, yada, yada. The other numbers I'd like to consider are the negative numbers, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, yada, yada, yada. Well, before I say anything, I want to point out it's this thing I'm evaluating, not those integers. So it's going to be the sign of these numbers. So minus pi, right, you get the idea? And then it's going to be minus pi over 2, and then minus pi over 3, and then minus pi over 4, and then minus pi over 5. Before I go on with that, I hope you realize we're talking about, you know, a sine function, right? And the sine function is going to look like this over here, right? When I'm talking about the negative numbers, you get positive be over here. But I got to be honest with you, what am I noticing about it? At minus pi, it's 0. Would that be agreed? But over here, what do I notice is they're all going to be negative numbers over here. No matter what I do with this, they're all going to be negative. Now, they're going to, they're going to go through this band of, of negative numbers over here, but I know something negative numbers are never going to be between those two. So I'm going to say, I don't have to think about that. And I, that, That's gone. I'm not thinking about this anymore. What am I thinking about? I'm thinking about these numbers now. So let's write this down for you. And as I write them down for you, it's writing them down. So what's the first one going to be? And again, I'm looking at pi over n. It's going to be pi, pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 4. And I think you get the idea. It goes on forever. So really what I'm looking at, I'm really just looking at this region of numbers over here. And those numbers are going to, you know, it's going to be pi, and then they're going to march backwards like this. Right? They're going to march backwards. Or they're getting smaller. You know, start at pi, that's 0. Right? Then the next number is going to be, you know, pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 4, yada, 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 and they march backwards. So they're all going to be positives. And that's important. All right? So what I'm going to claim over here is that I don't have to worry about those ones that are um, like minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. I'm just worried about 1, 2, 3, 4, so forth and so on. All right? So I uh, do you want to look, look at this over here? I'm going to tell you something. We need to look at the positive integers only. We just discussed that. So really what I'm looking at, I'm looking at the sine function, pi over n. What do I know about it for these particular numbers over here? It is always going to be less than or equal to 1. All right? Now, by the way, could it ever be equal to 1? Well, it could be equal to 1, right, if I took pi over 2. I'm up, update this a little bit. But the question is, could it ever be equal to 0? And the answer to that is no. It can never be equal to 0. And why is that? For the sine function to be equal to 0 in this interval over here, it might get close to it, 
But the bottom line is it really never going to get there. It's never going to get there, all right? Not going to happen. Here comes my problem, though. It's a large number of numbers to march through. And really what am I looking for? I'm looking for those numbers as we start marching in this direction, right? As we start marching in this direction over here. And by the way, we're marching in this direction over here. We're actually marching one after another. Boom, 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 boom. At some point, though, the band of this is going to be between one-third and one-quarter. I wonder what those numbers are, though. I don't know. So I'm going to say it's going to be between one-third and one-quarter. There's going to be some band over here where that's going to fit. All right? I just don't know where that is. All right? So as soon as how you're going to do that, I'm going to go through it one at a time until I get a pattern to it. All right? So the first thing I want to tell you about is that the sign of theta starts to look like theta. I mean, exactly. It's a linear function almost. When you're near, when theta is near zero, when you're near zero, all right? So I'm going to say over here, theta and sine theta would look exactly the same. So there's some end where this is going to get really small quick, all right? So what I do is I write things down. I know it's difficult to look at, though. I really do. All right, so the first one, the sign, if I took n to be 1, this is n equal 1, by the way. What do I get? 0. But 0 is definitely not in the band. What do I want? I want the sign of pi over n to be between, let me write that down for you, 1 third and 1 quarter. So this is failure. This is no good. No good. Now, if I did 1, what do I get? Pi over 2, which is 1, and that's greater than 1 third, so this is no good. Then I would do pi over 3, and that turns out to be root 3 over 2. Now, again, you're looking at root 3 over 2, and someone says, I wonder what that is. That's greater than 1 third. All right? It's greater than 1 third. What do I mean by that? 3 root 3s is greater than 2. You just square both sides. You get 4 on one side, other side. It's just bigger. I mean, it should be obvious, but it's bigger. All right? Pi over 4, 1 over root 2. It's about 0.7. That's also bigger. All right? Now, by the way, someone says, what are you doing over here? Well, I'm taking some liberties. There's no doubt about it. But what I'm saying over here is that these numbers over here, they're getting smaller. So I'm going to say they're roughly, like the sine of pi over 5 is roughly pi over 5, right? Not exactly, but roughly, right? Certainly greater than one third. And then pi over 6 is the valuable. I get 1 half, 1 third, right? 1 half greater than 1 third. Pi over 7, roughly speaking, it's about pi over 7, greater than 1 third, all right? And I keep doing this until I hit a success. And this is the first time I hit a success. The first time. What am I getting? At 10, when n is 10, I finally hit a number below one-third. Now, someone said, if I had a calculator to do this, it would be a lot quicker. Most competitive exams don't allow you to use a calculator. But I get, excess, I get a success of pi over 10. I got to keep moving. Pi over 11, I get success. Pi over 12, I get a success. And then all of a sudden, I get to this one over here, pi over 13, and it's going to be a failure. Again, you'd have to have some sense about what pi is and some sense about what, how to solve that. I want to point out what I mean by that. I'm kind of looking at that. And again, it, you know, my little you know, acorn-sized brain, I'm looking at this over here, and I'm saying, well, that's pretty clear to me that that's a failure. That 4 times pi is definitely less than 13. All right? So I'm going to say failure. So I only found a couple of successes, and I want to point out the successes are going to be. The successes I found by this analysis without using a calculator were 12, 11, and uh, 10. All right? So what was the question, though? What's the sum of the integers? I only found three that's successful. Again, if you had a calculator, it would be a lot easier, but 12, let me write this down, plus 11, plus 10. Some of those inches would be what? 
2333. All right, this was a, in my opinion, a tough problem. All right, your mileage may vary though. So let's talk about it. Going back over this, you know, I'm going to say problems that weren't too bad for me. Let me get my red highlighter out. I believe this one was okay. In hindsight, I don't think this one was that bad. In hindsight, I don't think this one was so bad. In hindsight, if I knew the remainder theorem and I knew about the, the conjugates and how to multiply them out, this one wasn't so bad. This one over here, again, I got to say it again. I thought this one was a tough problem. I thought number one was tough. All right? You may have a better idea, though. And I, I, I appreciate people have better ideas, by the way. Share it with me. What's my email address? Bannon, that's B as in boy, the at symbol, N-N-O-N dot U-S. And uh, let's just, just remind you over here, um, if I get overwhelmed with emails, I can't answer you. However, if I'm not overwhelmed and you write to me, I'll answer you. All right? Consider writing me. All right, now, someone's going to say, I, I want access to the document or to the LaTeX so I can share it with my students or just share it with whatever. And yeah, at some point it's going to be published. Right now it's not published. It's only being made available to this group, the Prison Mathematics Project participants. At some point when I feel it's, it's uh, looked at enough, I'll publish it and share it with other people. And if you want that, you know, email me and let me know you want that and I'll give it to you, all right? Or at least I'll, know you, I'll let you know where it's going to get published, all right? So um, I think that's all I wanted to say with this. And yeah, I really do appreciate you trying these problems and continue forward. It's not easy. I, I have a tough time with this stuff sometimes too. Sometimes I look at it one day, it's easy. Next day I look at the same exact problem, by the way, and I can't do it. It happens. It happens. It really does. You know, one day you're better at something than the other. So don't be discouraged if you look at these things and say, I can't do this problem or that problem. Be encouraged that you can't do something, that you can try to do something else. All right? Thank you for paying attention, though.